I have put this, uh, I have put this uh, in the, a mosaic image of a knot, you know, just for the sake of having a nice image on the beginning of the slideshow. And then I found myself doing uh, something else and ending up in the mirror image of this knot. So I thought I would show you the Google I was Google like this with a Spencer Brown mark and making it into a knot by coming uh, around like this. And then I was wondering what knot or link did I get so I drew it a little better. And it turned out to be the same as the mosaic I had started with, with the mirror image. This may or may not have anything to do with the talk. Um, now I do remind you um, that um, we can summarize quantum mechanics in the following way. This may be of some use during the talk. Um, that physical processes are modeled by unitary transformations applied to a state vector, um, a vector in a complex Hilbert space. So if it were finite dimensional, then there would be some finite basis vectors, and each one of those corresponds to um, something that can be observed in the situation, and they're supposed to be a list of all the observations that are possible under the circumstances. Coefficients are complex numbers, um, and when you measure that, you get, uh, you get the i basis element, that is whatever it corresponds to. Uh, with probability the absolute value squared of the coefficient. And um, without, any, um, without any input from the physics about how you get the unitary transformations, that's a summary of quantum mechanics and it uses complex numbers in a kind of an irreducible way like that. Mm. So, um, let me back up one step. Um, here is something that's not quantum mechanics. I'm looking at uh, a Brownian walk uh, with equal probability. Uh, um, a walker at point x can either go forward to x plus dx, or dx is some finite amount of distance. Can either go forward to x plus dx or backward to x minus dx, or if it's at x minus dx, it might go forward to x. If it's at x plus dx, it might end up at x. Um, so one can consider, and as I said, um, the probability of the walker moving from one point to an adjacent point is one half here. And so we want to think about this process of, one, of this random walker going along a, line, a discrete line. What is that funny? It's a synchronization yeah. problem. Um, it, it, uh, or maybe it's from the projector. Just tighten the contents. Yeah. So anyway, let, let, let's just think about this for a moment. Let, what's the probability that the particle is at x at time t? Well, you, if you knew the probability at, um, at time t, then you can figure out the probability at time t plus dt, because it goes with one half probability, either forward or backward. So if you knew the probability at the previous time, t, then you know that the probability at the given time, t plus dt, is one half of the chances that it's coming from x plus dx, and one half of the chances that it's coming from x minus dx. So that's a nice recursion formula. And it turns into a differential equation, as is well known. I'm not telling you anything that you don't maybe already know, but let's look at it anyway. Um, so if, we, if I were to subtract from p at x, t plus dt, p at x t, uh, then I can, um, I can subtract two of them in the middle there and divide the whole thing by two, right? It's still the same equation. But what you're looking at in the middle there is the second difference of uh, taking two differences just like t plus dt minus t, taking the second difference. Is this all right? You slide to t plus You bet. Slide to side. Slide to side. Oh. Slide towards you. Yeah, and I'm not sure. Okay. okay. Good. Right. So this is the second difference. If you take two discrete differences, that's what you're going to get. So this is like the second derivative with respect to space, not time. We're, we're making the changes in space on this side. 
changes in time on this side. If we were to divide by dt here, then we would have one derivative with respect to space. If we wanted to get a derivative with respect to time, we'd have to do this derive, and this is the second difference, we have to divide by dx squared. So what you would have over here now, if you divided this by dx squared, you have to multiply by dx squared, you'd have dx squared divided by dt, um, divided by 2. So you would get this, that's what you would have out here. dx squared over dt divided by 2, and then, then what you have in here is dp dt, discrete derivative, and d squared d, dx squared, discrete derivative. All right? So, so this recursion formula, this simple probability consideration, leads to the differential equation, derivative of the probability with respect to t is equal to some constant divided by 2, second derivative with respect to space. That's called the diffusion equation. And k, if it were constant, is called the diffusion constant. So if you think of a process where the dx squared divided by dt remains constant, and you take a limit if you want to, as dt and dx go to zero, um, then what you're looking at is uh, a nice differential equation called the diffusion equation. Now, the curious thing is that if we went back behind the, the description of quantum mechanics on the previous slide, all the way back to Schrodinger, um, then we find that what Schrodinger said was, and I guess this is in the middle of a, of a um, something else that's on the slide, but don't read the slide just yet, let's just look at Schrodinger's equation here. I found this on the internet, I thought it was quite amusing because the person decided to include Schrodinger's cat in his blackboard drawing of uh, Schrodinger's equation. Um, but Schrodinger's equation looks like this, and uh, this is the potential energy, of course, and let's forget the potential energy, and this is the second space derivative of psi, this is, um, this is the time derivative, and you see that if you were to just say divide by h bar here, um, then you would have a constant over here, and you would have an i here. So Schrodinger's equation looks like the diffusion equation, except that there's an i in it. If you were to remove the i and just put a real constant in here, and forget about that, um, then that would be our diffusion equation, and, and we would be not looking at quantum mechanics, we'd be looking at the probability of a particle going to take a Brownian walk. But, um, but it's a very curious fact that Schrodinger's equation is just like the diffusion equation, except that there's an I in it. Um, and, and so I'm going to tell you a fable about that, but let's talk about that a little bit more before we do, because you see, what, for, for various uh, interesting reasons, for which I will not remind you of all of them, Schrodinger comes up with this equation, right? Um, and, and then, in the history of things, Schrodinger doesn't think that this has to do with probabilities, right? He thinks that it has to do with the density of the wave and that matter is going to be replaced by waves. Um, and on the other hand, you can easily see, if you look at the properties of Schrodinger's equation, that the integral of psi psi star, where that's the complex conjugate of psi, the integral of psi psi star over space is time invariant. It's an easy consequence of Schrodinger's equation. That's the inner product back there in the complex vector space. The inner product is psi psi star, or s s star, if you like. You multiply it by its complex conjugate. And so, and so, um, and so, if you so it was Max Horn's op and other people's observations. Something going on over there? Yeah. Yeah, somebody's just turned up, but I think Diane's explained to whoever she is. Right. So it's Mac, Max Horn and other people's observation that, well, if that, if that complex inner product, we can take the complex inner product to be the integral of psi psi star over space, then that looks like a probability distribution because it's remaining constant under, under the evolution of the, of, the, of the equation. That means the evolution of the equation is keeping that inner product fixed. The evolution of the equation is a unitary transformation. So the time evolution of Schrodinger's equation is unitary, and that's where this description comes from. All right? um, but people decided to interpret it as probability rather than anything else, and that turned out to be very accurate 
Um, um, if you don't think probability means based in probability, it just means the frequency with which things are going to occur when you make observations. No one knows what we're counting here. So we started with something. We started with something where we oops, not that far back. We started with something here where we know exactly what we're counting. We're counting where it is and how many times it's likely to be there. But then you put an I in there, and for some strange reason, you end up with Schrodinger's equation. Um, so one can try to ask, well, can I explain the I in some way? Um, and I'm going to uh, do it by a little fable here, all right? So I'll read it. So here's a little story about the square root of minus one in quantum mechanics. God said, I would really like to be able to base the universe on the Schrodinger, on the diffusion equation, but I need to have some possibility for interference in waveforms, and so it should be simple. And so I'll just put a plus or minus ambiguity into this equation like that. Not an I, but a plus or minus ambiguity. This is good, but not quite right. I don't play dice, so the plus or minus coefficient plus or minus coefficient will have to be lawful, not random. Nothing is random, what shall I do? I'll place, take the plus or minus to me in a strictly alternating sequence like that, and time will be discrete. And then the equation will become a difference equation in space and time. Mm -hmm. And now I've written this with, with, uh, with delta t equal to 1 to keep things simple. Now the kappa is just 1 half, and we're back without the minus 1 to the t at the, at the difference formula for the Brownian walk, exactly, right? But I put a minus one to the t in there. Minus one to the t is what this is. At every time step, it flips its parity going along like that. Um, and, um, and d squared x of psi is going to be the second difference, so I'll just write it that way. And dx psi, dt psi will be this. And, um, and of course, you can put the dt's in there if you want to. That'll do it, but I have to consider the continuum limit of such a thing. And then there's no meaning to minus 1 to the t, right? Minus 1 to the t is not working at all for me in that sense. But as long as t is finite, then it's either plus or minus 1. So, so what, what will we do with this? Um, well, I can divide, I can divide the, uh, the size into the ones that are even, that have an even subscript and the ones that are odd, the ones that have an odd subscript. And then our diffusion equation, let's go back to it, our modified diffusion equation says that at time t plus 1, the derivative is going to be equal to minus 1 to the t times that space derivative at time t. So I think of it as shifted by one time. And so that means that if it's odd here, then it becomes even here. If it's even here, it becomes odd there. That's what I wrote on the next slide, that the derivative time of psi even is, is some multiple of psi odd, space derivative. And the derivative of psi odd is a minus some multiple space e, uh, of the even, because when you're um, odd, you get a minus 1. All right? So, um, so then you could take the continuum limit of psi even and psi odd separately. Separately. Now, in fact, if you now go back and think about what this funny thing is doing, and made it into a recursion, and I'll write it later, then um, there isn't really any hope of it, um, of it converging for both psi even and psi odd anyway, because it's flipping back and forth. But if you choose psi even, uh, if you choose psi even, then it looks just like the fusion equation, and it will be converging, but it's not quite the diffusion equation. If you choose psi odd, it can converge. So we put two non-converging, we put one, those two things together into a time sequence of events which are not converging, they're oscillating, um, like that. Um, and then we have this. But now, what's the, so then you see that you have arrived at Schrodinger's equation if you just use i in the usual form. You've arrived at it, because if you let psi be psi even plus i psi odd, and you know that the derivative on psi even gives you the psi odd, and the derivative on psi odd gives you the derivative on, uh, minus the derivative on psi even, then it follows at once that if you, if you do a little algebra, and I wrote it on another slide, that if you take the derivative of this with respect to time, and you'll get these two, and you look at how it worked itself out, and you see that this is how it plays out, exactly. 
that the i times the d psi dt, which is this complex number, is now equal to that, and we have the Schrodinger equation. So the Schrodinger equation is the same as this recursion here. So this is a discrete picture of the Schrodinger equation, all packed up into one temporal process with this alternation, this, this bit change at every stage in time. And this is formally equivalent to the Schrodinger equation. Now, this is uh, very, very similar, if not identical, perhaps, to what Garnett was talking about by putting in his clock, his binary clock. But what I didn't understand, and I still don't understand about Garnett, so we'll, maybe we can think about it later, uh, is exactly how this has to do with some kind of invariant, relativistic invariance, which he mentioned in his talk. So I, I can't. I can't tell you how this fits into that part of what he did. But it certainly is a way of fitting the Schrodinger equation into a, into a discrete process, which is an interesting one to look at. Now let's follow the slide forward. This is where so, we... Just tell me, so what, what does God think about I when, when he puts, or she rather puts it in <laughs> So there? in this case, in this case, the I became, at this stage in our, our discussion of it, the I became a convenient descriptor to take this guy, which has, um, which has two components, right? A two-component situation, right. um, where one of them uh, goes plus and the other goes minus, and they, and they go from even to odd and odd to even, right? right? This is a description of that process. You can pack it up into this. I squared is minus one, and manages the symmetry right going back and forth between the even and the odd algebraically just perfectly. Okay. Maybe it would be good to skip forward to the slide where I wrote it out. Um, there. I'm sorry, that's a little dim. Um, but there, here it is again, right? Psi naught, psi one, psi two, psi three, psi four, all those things. And we pack them all up into psi even, the, one, the even ones, and psi odd, the odd ones. Uh, meaning that this stands for any one of them, or at some time it would be one of them. At some time, this would be one of them. So then we have these equations. If you take the time period with this one and that, and so on, we pack it up like this. And now here's the here, here it is. Here's the algebra. If you wanted to just watch it, I take the derivative of psi. So that means I take the derivative of psi even and i times the derivative of psi odd. The derivative of psi even is the second derivative with a plus sign, and the derivative of psi odd is even with the derivative of minus sign. And now I factor off the k and the dx squared, and I'm looking at psi odd minus psi even. And I can factor out a minus i. If you multiply this by minus i, you will get minus i psi even and 1 psi odd minus i times i is 1. So there's psi even plus i psi odd. So this is um, psi. So you see I have dt, dt psi is minus i gamma dx squared psi. Multiply by both sides by i, and here we are. Yeah, yeah. You see, so so yeah. i and its funny property of having the square minus one uh, will pick up this pick this pattern up involving these two and pack them together into one. Yeah. Yeah. Packs them together into one without having the problem of the limit of the parity. So you could say that you have this you have this discrete process, discrete oscillatory yeah. process, which uh, we're looking at. But that discrete oscillatory process has some features which, when you take the limit of it, are just disappear because that parity isn't there anymore. But if you separate it into the even part and the odd part of the process, then you can keep the parity and keep track of what goes on. And, and then it turns out that you can describe all that with I. Yeah. So I then, I from this point of view, becomes a, a way of looking at the way you describe this discrete process, this process of discrete physics. Yeah, yeah. So, so for me, that's helpful to think of it that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I want to go further about the I, but uh, let's take our time. Yeah. Did I miss anything here? Uh, yeah, um, I have my, uh, my protagonist talking here, and, and this has to do with the nature of the I. So he said, Finally, a use for that so-called imaginary number that Merlin has been bothering me with. Um, this i has the property that it squares minus 1, so i times i a plus i b is i a minus b, um, and i is minus 1 over i. 
And if I look at i equals minus 1 over i, you see that it, it can't be real because if i was equal to 1, then i would be equal to minus 1. Put a 1 in there, you get minus 1. If i is 1, then it's minus 1. Looks like a paradox in this form. And so if you were to think of it that way, I keep trying to reevaluate it, then it just spends its time oscillating between plus 1 and minus 1, doing it lawfully in the sense that when it's 1, it's minus 1 and vice versa. And so you can think of that i is plus or minus 1 in some sense. Yeah. And then, in fact, I can see now what Merlin was getting at. Uh, when I multiply i times i, plus or minus 1 times plus or minus 1, I get minus 1 because the i takes a little time to oscillate. And so by the time the second term multiplies the first term, they're just out of phase. And so we either get plus minus equals minus or minus plus equals minus. And either way, i squared equals minus 1, and we have this perfection of ambiguity <laughs> by adding the phase in the right way. Yeah. Now, isn't of course, what? what? Uh, uh, isn't this what Dirac did? Um, uh, I don't think he did it like that. But um, I've always puzzled the connection between Dirac's equation and Schrodinger's equation, and you Well, in fact, I'm going to talk about Dirac's equation in a few minutes, so yeah. maybe you want to say something further about Dirac. I don't know if Dirac was thinking of, uh, of, the, of the eye as, a, as, a, as an oscillation. I, I, I'm sure he wasn't. But you have uh, tied the things together. Uh, yeah, I think we have tied it together in an interesting way. And since I am going to talk about Durant, I think you may have a further comment in a couple of slides down the line. So, so let's continue. Um, now, over. May, may yeah. I, uh, I, I'm just thinking uh, you shift. Uh, so to say, I don't know if, if it's uh, just nonsense, but uh, uh, uncertainty from uh, space to the oscillation of the T, which you pack into the mathematics of the eye. That's right. That's right. The eye is an ambiguity or an uncertainty of a yeah. certain kind. Yes. So what, what, what's but then, what, as my deity what, said, uh, he doesn't play dice, so he made it into a very strict kind of yeah. alternation. But what, what, what's the rationale of it? What's the rationale of what? Uh, of, of doing this move. Oh, well, yeah, you see I'm back in engineering, so, um, so that's why I, I made it into, um, into a deity who decided to do it, because, um, because uh, this, if, we, uh, if you now understand the whole yoga of what I meant by plus or minus, you're still, uh, it's still a bit mysterious as to why, why should we go from diffusion equation, a simple probabilistic process, to this more complex oscillating process, right? Not obvious, right? Um, that's why perhaps if we can decipher, or if I can decipher, or we all decipher, well, Garnett's further remark that it has to do with relativity in some subtle way, that would help, right? Um, but, but what I'm saying is that, indeed, here is, um, maybe, let me go, ahead, go one step further on, um, this slide, all right, so, but I'm sorry that, so, I, I thought it would be nice to see it handwritten, but it's uh, kind, of, kind of dim, but I think you see the middle of the slide, all right, all I did was, let me explain what I just did, here's the diffusion equation, with the minus one of the t in front of it, all right? So this is our, our discrete diffusion equation. Psi t plus one minus psi t divided by dt, and there's the dx squared over two dt, the constant, and so on, right? But if I, if I just walk backwards from that, I'm gonna walk backwards from that, getting rid of the extra terms, the, the, the canceling terms, and then I'm here, all right? And I put it on the right-hand side. This is what, I re what we replace the, the Brownian walk probability formula with, right? This is the process. Psi at t plus 1 is 
given by minus 1 to the t over 2, and then there's a contribution from x minus dx, x plus dx, and x itself sometimes, right? And it's not, so, so you're, you're thinking, and so in this situation, it's, it's, a, it, it's not probabilistic anymore, but what, what came in is natural enough that you're at a given, you're, you're at a given point and you want to know where did the walker come from? And he might have come from the left or the right, or he might have come right from where you were, he didn't move. That's what got added. Sometimes he didn't move. But you haven't included that in the initial probability, because in the initial probability... No, no, I could have, of course. I could have said I have a more modified Brownian walk yeah. where the walker didn't move. But, yeah. but that just happened to come in when we modified it. When we modified it, every other, at every other turn, it didn't move. Uh, I mean, it's possible that it didn't move. Yeah. And then these are no longer probabilities, right? So we're talking about a process which isn't just a simple process anymore. Why did it turn into negative and positive probabilities? Well, my deity said he wanted waveforms of interference, right? This is certainly one way in which things will interfere. They interfere because you can have a plus and you can have a minus and they will interfere, right? And, and, um, and he was designing by saying, well, I would like to make it have waveforms and interference in a really simple way, starting with the thing that I already, that he already knew, which was diffusion, and he put the plus or minus one in. That's not a sufficient reason, right? Um, it's only a, a stopgap. But what we did get was an interesting reformulation of Schrodinger as a discrete process. Right? And we can try to think from there further. But it, there's still a lot of questions yeah, yeah. if you're trying to interpret quantum mechanics. Yeah, well, so, when we try to think like God, it is quite a big question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and, 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 so, and so I'm focusing on the eye for a little while, and then we'll come back to Durant. But I'm focusing on the eye. Now, if we're focusing on the eye and not worrying about the rest, then you see that this statement here is not satisfactory either, right? I mean, you would like the mathematics to automatically get that phase shift for you. You don't want to say, well, sometimes they're, they're when you multiply them, they, they flip each other, right? So, so we need we need to uh, to do something about that. Um, this slide is repeating what I said before that you can think of the square root of minus one as a discrete oscillation, as a reentry. Uh, into itself as a recursion. Um, but then the bottom of the slide is showing us one more thing, that if you have the oscillation, you can think of it as oscillating from plus to minus, or as oscillating from minus to plus. And these two can represent the two phase shifted versions, shifting the phase by, by one step on half period, right? And then, and then uh, we can do the following. This is Doing the, uh, turning what I said into algebra, I'm going to define another operator, a temporal shift operator, which when you take one waveform and have it with a shift operator next to it, if you put the operator on the other side, it turns into the phase shifted version. And the square of the phase shifting operator will be one. So this is just a little temporal displacement operator. If you're on this side, it's at this time, it's at this time, but if you put it on the other side, it gets shifted by one time step. So the minus one plus one will turn into a plus one minus one. And, and then I think of this as a waveform. A B represents a waveform with a particular point of view. And I multiply them turn by turn. So a waveform A B, A B, A B, and another one, C B, C B, C B will, will combine with your A C B D A C B D A C B D. And then we'll define I formally to be the 1 minus 1 with a little time-sensitive thing next to it. That's the time-sensitive ambiguity. Because if you multiply, if you take two of them and combine them, you well, here's what happens. I combine these two, but in order to get in order to combine them, I have to uh, I have to use the time step, say shift this to the left, and then this turns into the other one, phase shift. You combine them and you get minus one, and these go away. And now you have a formal picture of what I said before, that when you multiply the two ambiguities, they give you minus one, because one of them shifts the other in time. 
So this is a time sensitive entity. And when it interacts with something else, it causes whatever it interacts with to do a little time shift. So you can think of it as a something which requires time in order to happen. Taking a derivative is a something which requires time in order to happen. But this is a primordial entity that requires time in order to happen. So we're interpreting the I as a primordial entity which requires time in order to happen, in this sense. Uh, but, but then you see, once we did that, uh, we're in a com combination of time-sensitive and time-insensitive entities. Because there is the 1 minus 1 after all, it's still there. And it doesn't change under time. And you can have combinations of these. And so we're in a larger algebra immediately. Um, we have things like this, 1 minus 1, whose square is 1, multiplied by itself. You have things like this where they change because of the time sensitivity. Um, and, uh, and we have eta, the, the operator that does the time shifting, and that squares to one. And we have that e times eta is minus eta times e. That's, this, that's what this is saying, right? If this is one minus one, then this becomes minus one one and changes sign. So as far as e is concerned, this little e here, it's e eta is minus eta e. Now I'm doing a little abstract algebra to show you the pattern, but the point is that non-commutativity came in. It really is there from the beginning because of that time sensitivity. So you have this, this is called the Clifford algebra. This, this is an example of the Clifford algebra, a small Clifford algebra. Nice little Clifford algebra, elements square to one, and they anti-commute with one another. And I is their consequence from the point of view of algebra. I is their consequence. I is E times eta, E times eta. And E times eta multiplied by E times eta <coughs> will be equal to minus 1 by dint of what happens here. So, so we, end up in the, we end up immediately in a non-commutative context as soon as we start to think about the nature of I from this point of view. I, I just want to say, I just want to point out that I think what you're saying is is very important in the sense of introducing this notion of time in this discrete way. Because, you know, you're saying that it's a primordial time yeah. entry. So I'm and saying that this yeah. initial entrance into non-commutativity is directly related to discrete time. Mm. And the most simple discrete time of plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus. <coughs> and that's related to not that, not that, not that, not that, or, re or just pure re-entry. So, uh, so it goes all the way back to those very fundamental notions of recursion and discreteness. And so t I is a symbolic entity that comes out naturally out of this, uh, out, of, uh, out of articulating uh, the simplest discrete dynamical system that you can think of. And the Schrodinger equation is a kind of superposition of of the of the of the diffusion dynamics and this fundamental clocking dynamics yeah. Yeah. needs more thought, but but but, but, but that's correct in the sense of yeah. yeah. I want to ask what may be a stupid question, but is there any rational in all of this? ignoring the fact that the square root of 1 is a dual value. value. Uh, Phi, the square root of 1 is plus or minus 1. The square root of 1, yes. Yeah. That's is there true. any reason logic for ignoring all of this in our algebras? Well, that's interesting. The square root, it's like the square root of 1 is more like the bracket 1 minus 1 without the time shifter, right? Isn't it? Um, it isn't forced to go into time. And so it could be either plus one or minus one. It's the normal ambiguity. It's more like the diffusion, more like the diffusion equation, which could be left and it could be right. And it's something strange. But the square root minus one is, is, um, is stranger. And then there's the paradox of recursion that's going on. 
So you could think that Schrodinger is somehow the superposition of the square root of 1 and the square root of minus 1. Yeah, I, I like that. Um, okay. Well, I, I think before the digital age, when we had these things, we probably thought of a clock more in terms of, you know, like a pendulum. Yeah, a pendulum, of course, goes back and forth and back and forth. So you've replaced the sinusoid with a, um, with a square wave? Yes. Yeah. Except it's discrete, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so then it's worth remarking at this point that we've reinvented matrix algebra. Um, you see, if I think of the AB, the one without the time sensitivity, as the diagonal entries in the 2 by 2, and the other one as the anti diagonal entries in the 2 by 2, uh, then you will see that everything works exactly as I have described. I, I'll leave it to you to do that because. We don't want to spend a lot of time on the algebra. But the, the main point is that we, we started with just thinking about I uh, and, and uh, discrete process. We come into non-commutative algebra immediately and the Clifford algebra immediately. The very Clifford algebra that we're about to see when we look at Dirac. So, um, so indeed, uh, the sense that we're not very far away from Dirac is, is correct. Um, and let me continue with Dirac. So, so I'm going to use E and Eta to construct Dirac, but you know, I've already said that. And, um, so what in this slide should you read? Um, uh, well, you should understand that for me, the speed of light is equal to 1, and Planck's constant is equal to 1. And so uh, equations become a little simpler. Um, and this is the basic equation relating energy and momentum and mass in special relativity under those conditions, speed, light, and one. Yeah. E, it's Pythagorean. E squared is P squared plus M squared. And this was where Dirac started in trying to get a Schrodinger type equation for, um, uh, for that would be relativistically invariant. Started with this. And you would like to have an energy operator like the I B by dt is the energy operator in the Schrodinger equation. It's what extracts energy. But it's, it's a first order. And you'd like a first order operator for, uh, for the energy. So, you'd be, you'd, so Dirac cleverly, um, brilliantly decided that he would just go ahead and try to take a square root here. Um, and the way, uh, I don't know if I did a good slide on this one. Now I'll go to the next slide. Yeah, all right. So, so, so Dirac said, all right, let's try E is equal to alpha times B plus beta times M, where alpha and beta are not necessarily commuting. They might be matrices. Uh, and then you square it. And what do you get when you square it? Well, you get alpha squared P squared. You get beta squared M squared. And then you get P M times alpha beta and beta alpha, because we didn't keep track of uh, whether they, it's not necessarily commuting. And then this would work, this would be p squared plus m squared, if alpha squared was 1, beta squared was 1, and alpha beta is minus beta alpha. There is the Clifford algebra again, coming from relativity this time. So, um, so indeed, we're very close to relativity, uh, in perhaps a different way than what, uh, what we were talking about when Carnapus uh, was talking to us. But, but the, the same Clifford algebra that's related to I, I, I fits into that Clifford algebra, or that Clifford algebra creates I, because if you have alpha and beta that satisfy this, then alpha times beta squared would be minus one. That's, that's the time where, you've, where I was saying, I'll think of one of these as the waveform and the other one as the temporal shift operator. But, but now they're neutral, neutral. They're just a couple of guys who square the square to one and then I commute. And then then Dirac says, well, okay, that means that means that I can make my energy operator in the form of alpha times momentum operator plus beta times mass operator. And then it will work out right and I can write down the equation. Now let's go back and be clear about that. Um, when you're doing this analogy to Schrodinger's equation, the energy operator should be I D by dt. But we're going to write it as equal to alpha times the momentum operator, which in these units is just minus I d by dx. I'm sorry that I, I mean, I like to show you the motivation for everything, but it gets too long. So I, I eliminated the 
talking about the standard motivations for why we choose these operators, but we'll just take them. And then the equation is going to be that E hat, the energy operator applied to psi, should be equal to E times psi under eigenvalue conditions, where E is the actual value of the energy. And momentum operator will be momentum times psi, and position will be just position times psi. Um, and, um, and, so, um, and so then how do you build the equation? Well, you build it like this. Energy applied to psi is equal to um, the energy operator, which is alpha p, alpha times p, that's the p hat, I mean, alpha p hat, p hat is i d dot dx, and, um, and um, 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 m, beta m, you see? So there's a differential equation of Schrodinger tuck. Only now we have these Clifford algebra elements in it as well as I itself. And that's a direct equation in one dimension. One dimension of time, one dimension of space. That's how Dirac comes to it. That's his story. Um, so it's a very beautiful line of thought. Um, one could go backwards in the way I was doing and try to turn everything into a discrete process. Well, I didn't actually work all that out. It would be fun to do that. Um, but I'm going forwards in a certain sense because I want to show you some things. So then the operator itself applied to psi equals zero. Well, that just means I put everything on one side and then it's i d by dt plus i alpha d by dx minus beta m. Just put everything on the other side. So there's the direct operator in this sense. Okay. Um, and we're trying to solve this equation. So let's try to solve it. Um, so here's the Dirac operator. And now I'm going to take a plane wave. A plane wave is e to the i px minus et. Those are the numerical values of energy and momentum. Um, and this is a little complex plane wave. Okay? And we'll apply the Dirac operator to it. Now what is that going to do? It's going to take and pull down uh, the energy because we're taking the derivative with respect to time of a minus i multiplied by i, oh, yeah, i times minus i is one, so I just pulled down the energy times the wave. And when I take the derivative with respect to x, I pull down a minus alpha p because there's a p here, and the beta m comes in like that, minus. Um, and, um, minus. did it sign wrong? I'm not going to worry about my signs now. Looks like I've got a sign now. Um, well, I guess there may be, the algebra may be, may be going wrong a little bit, but we'll worry about it later. Um, the thing to notice is that if I multiply, it, so I, I didn't solve the direct equation, did I? I got some funny, algebraic uh, fact factor on the plane wave, right? Ah, but let's multiply that front factor by beta alpha. Remember, beta alpha is the square root of minus one. Oh, and I should have told you that the I I'm using is a separate I from the I that's generated by beta alpha. Beta alpha squared is minus one. But I have imported as direct view an extra I that commutes with everybody uh, for my own convenience. Okay, sorry, but uh, uh, that, that's the way it goes, right? Um, and, and, so, and so I'm multiplying this by beta alpha. And notice I get beta alpha E plus beta rho because beta alpha times alpha is just beta with a minus sign. That, that sounds good. And then beta times beta alpha just gives me alpha. And now, what happens if you square u? Well, uh, this guy squared is minus 1. This guy squared is 1. This guy squared is 1. And, um, and these anti-commute so that, um, you know, this one goes away. How can you pronounce this? And so you get minus e squared plus p squared plus m squared, uh, which is equal to 0. But u squared is equal to 0, and we have a note book. Uh, what I'm doing here is tumbling over to Peter. Okay, that's what I'm doing. Um, so, so you see, it follows 
that if I take this u, this no potent, and multiply it by the e to the i px minus et, then I will be a solution to the Dirac equation because I'm going to pull down when I take the derivative another u multiplied by something, and the square root is zero. And so that's a solution to the Dirac equation. And the solution to the Dirac equation is corresponding to this interesting combination of elements in the Clifford algebra multiplied by energy, momentum, and mass. So the solution of this fundamental fermion is, is basically this algebra expression. That algebra expression is the fermion in some sense. And this is just, uh, and this exponential over here is just a way of uh, keeping track of it, right? From this point of view. Um, so, um, so one thing you can do to pretty this up a little bit is to multiply the Dirac operator itself by a beta alpha, shifting the coefficients, but it still has these algebra coefficients. And then this equation will be uh, direct. You will pull down the u when you differentiate, and then when you do it twice, you will get zero. So, so, uh, so then it's an interesting way to look at it because then when you apply it to the plane where you create the fermion, and when you apply it again, you annihilate the fermion. So the, so the Dirac operator actually is the creation operator for the fermion, or the u is multiplying by u is the creation operator for the fermion. So now we're fully in, in, um, in exactly the same domain that Peter is talking about. I just wanted to draw a line from the classical way of talking about the Dirac equation over to the no potent point of view. Um, and, uh, and to point out how fundamentally related it is to the little Clifford algebra that it starts with. Of course, um, you, you, uh, uh, you can do this with, um, with more dimensions, and then it's perfectly natural to do it with two copies of, uh, of the Clifford algebra. Uh, and uh, if you'd like to use the quaternions, you can shift to the quaternions and have two copies of the quaternions and get all of the kind of things that Peter talks about, the way he talks about. Um, but let's see how we're doing it. Our time is okay. Um, um, uh, then you can, um, you can see some other things. For example, if I reverse time and change this line here, then I will get a, a, U, uh, a, a corresponding U data, a U for the reverse time. And then I have the two U's whose squares are zero. Um, and you can think of this as the antiparticle. And then if you look at how they don't commute, um, you get a, a positive commutator equation. U, U dagger plus U dagger, U is a constant. Usually normalized equal to one by dividing by something. But the, but the characteristic, uh, this is also in, in Peter. I'm just, um, I'm just putting it in this context to connect it up with the way people usually talk about the Dirac equation. So, uh, so this observation of Peters is really um, tremendous from my point of view, I think, because uh, usually you read about the, uh, the, the uh, algebra, which is the operator algebra, creation and annihilation operators associated with a fermion in a physics book, you read about them as basically just postulated. Postulated by analogy to the way things work for bosons. And not, not coming directly out of uh, solutions to the Dirac equation or anything like that. Here the operator algebra is actually right there. There it is. Um, it is the way the fermions behave. And, and, so, um, and so that's very amazing and beautiful. And I think it's nice to have it in, in these different languages. It's in, it's in Peter's language very beautifully, and, and it's actually in Dirac's language very nicely this way. And furthermore, we can we could do more. We could think about the discrete systems that are in back of that by going backwards the way I was talking about before. Can you get a, a hint of what happens in interactions? What, the, the, what happens the rationale for interactions between such? Oh, you mean interactions of particles? Yeah, the fermions. Give me a hint. How it might be approached with this Yeah, well, the algebra, the algebra uh, also contains interactions of particles. So Peter details quite a bit about that. Um, you and, uh, you can put a potentials mm -hmm. in the operator. doesn't have to be just the d by dt. You can have the potentials as well. 
You can add any number, it can be a covariant derivative, you can add as many as up, uh, but the fields as you want into the operator itself. So the E or the P operator includes those, and you still get the same structure in the algebra. What sort of labor is needed to accommodate the structures of an atom? Yeah, for, for example, let's take a hydrogen atom. You, well, you need to at least two electrons to get some interest in my house. No, just, but, well, you can have two electrons if you want. Right. So you have your potential added to your dt, d by dt term, usually. You, you, you string along the potentials after it, and that changes the, the, the term E that you get as the eigenvalue. And it also changes the phase term you get, instead of being just the ordinary exponential. So more oh, of course, there's terms. lots more things that you might want to do, like to, if you want a more complex field, then you're going to take uh, you're going to take uh, series combinations of these elementary fermion fields, right? Um, Fourier the, series in that. The, the, uh, to, to show the effects of fluorescence, and just to yeah. take that as an example. It's not so we're, we're skirting, uh, in, in here we're just skirting the formal level of the most elementary parts of the physics, right? And yeah. and yeah, sure, sure, it's the path I was interested in, not the, not the results. So I, I don't see it at the moment, but anyway. Right. Well, you put in the potential. But what, I've got 10 minutes, so let me, let me see what I can fill in for the rest of it in 10 minutes. But um, I'm happy we did this much. So I want to talk a little more about electrons um, and elementary particles. And the most elementary mathematical particle you could think of would be a particle which interacted with itself to either annihilate itself or reproduce itself. Um, Majorana considered the possibility of such particles um, in the 1930s by looking at the Dirac equation as uh, uh, with the operators adjusted in such a way that it would have real solutions so that the particle would be a 10 lambda particle. Um, but um, there's a curious algebraic crack here, which is worth looking at again. Um, Here's the, here's the situation. Um, I'm going to, actually I think I, well, all right. I can't motivate this so easily. Um, I'm going to tell you that I'm going to associate with, um, oh well, yeah, um, sorry. Um, and maybe I just shouldn't use the, t it's the 10 minutes that's following me. Um, um, I'm going to have my favorite, my favorite Clifford algebra here. A and B, such that A squared is 1, B squared is 1, and AD plus BA is equal to 0. Uh, I'm going to tell you that it makes sense to think of each of these as a Majorana fermion. Um, but let me explain why by going in another direction. An ordinary fermion, as we just saw, is somebody who's, uh, which has uh, an operator who's square and the dagger squared is zero, and you have this commutation relation. We just saw that. So that's a starting point. Now, consider this. Suppose that I had A and B, my favorite Clifford algebra, and I form a U, which is A plus IB, and a U star, which is A minus IB. Well, then they are nilpotents. Can you do that in your head? A plus IB times A plus IB is A squared minus B squared plus I times AB plus BA. It's Dirac's trick again, right? And AB plus BA is zero. A squared is one minus B squared is one, zero. So it's zero. The square of this is zero. So, um, so you can build no potents by writing them in terms of our favorite elementary Clifford algebra. That builds no potents. We could build the no potents we had before that way if we wanted to. Um, and the conjugate one, the one for the antiparticle, has the same property. And then if you figure out the commutation relation between these two, u u star plus u star u, you find it's uh, equal to a constant. So that says that a fermion, a fermion like an electron or a direct fermion like from the plane wave, it has the appearance of being composed of two Majorana fermions, being composed of two things which are described by the two elements in the Clifford algebra. 
It looks self-referential because look the Clifford algebra you started with to make the equation, yeah, but, they, but it isn't the same elements. It, uh, so the, it leads to the question, are our electrons under some circumstances looking like composites of pairs of myron fermions? Are they looking like, uh, does an, is an electron uh, actually looking like it's made out of two particles and it has an antiparticle because of the conjugation that, that happens here to turn it into a different one. That's a great question. And, uh, oh, there it is. There's the algebra. Um, what I just said. And this one, because the squares of these things are zero, you just get this plus times that. Well, you don't want to see the algebra anyway. So, um, um, so Majorana, as I said, was thinking about those things a long time ago. And more recently, people started theorizing, Kataev back around 2000, about what it would be like if, the, if electrons in a, in a nanowire were paired Majorana fermions or were associated with Majorana fermion operators. And then you he, he, you can deduce quite a bit about what the physics would be like and how certain kinds of correlations between the ends of the wire would, would appear because of that decomposition. And people claim more recently to actually observe it. Other people realize that myron fermions, if you follow them individually as moving around, say, in a plane, have grading properties, and so there's topology associated with it. Um, and, um, it's fun to see how that simple Clifford algebra gives rise to the grading properties. And I think this slide will do. Um, here's, here's the simplest one, which gives rise to the quaternions. I have three. I have A, B, and C now. And I'm going to form, they all square to one, and they all end I commute, OK? I just went up to three, that would be two. And then I have I, B, B, A, and J, B, C, B, and K, the AC, and, and you can have fun verifying that it's the quaternions, right? Uh, and, um, and then the braiding comes about by some associated operators. You form 1 plus i, 1 plus j, and 1 plus k, and you find, and with a factor, and you find out that if, if a is that, and b is that, and c is that, and you multiply them, then A followed by B followed by A is the same as B followed by A followed by B. That's the pattern of grading, as you see, because this is uh, equivalent topologically to that. You can think of taking this string and pulling it down that way and taking this cross and shifting it up that way, and they're equivalent. So, so topological properties of the algebra appear, um, and so you start with this very, very simple Clifford algebra situation, which is as close to the simple discrete dynamical system as you can get. You can just extend a little bit, and you find that you're looking at topology. You're looking at braiding. And not only that, but this braiding might actually be happening physically in some situations, if one had physical situations where you could see the Majorana fermion effects. So, um, so that's probably a good place to stop. Um, we could do more of that. I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you, Drew. Uh, any questions? Uh, just a quick one, because I noticed there was a slide which was saying evidence for my run for fermions. I mean, I've, I've only, because I don't know that much physics, I've only heard of my What kind of evidence is there? Yeah, 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 there was a, a thing. Yeah, there was there, one there slide. Are, people are doing things like taking a uh, a very thin water um, and examining the, the, the way uh, it conducts and looking at the correlations. And, uh, and this is a, a, a slide from one of those papers. Uh, it's superconductivity. It's, so it's, it's, super, uh, it's in superconductivity uh -huh. okay. okay. context. That's okay. right. Thank it's, you. it's a simple thing that we've been evidence for vial fermions with no mass. Mm -hmm. And that's also condensed matter. Right. You, you can get the, these pseudo states in condensed matter always. It, it's whether you, there really are any out there as well. So, so this evidence would be for condensed matter, presumably, uh -huh. rather okay. than for actually what, what, just fundamental. Yeah, okay.
because biothermians are also half a thermian as well, in different way. The, the, the Majorana ones are half because they cut down on the, on the momentum term, and the violent ones are half because they cut down on the mass term. And there's another, there's another way in which uh, things like Majorana fermions uh, come up, uh, can, and that is um, not with single electrons, but with coactivities of electrons in a supercooled plate. And you have a metal plate in a magnetic field, and the electrons are circulating the magnetic field lines, forming big combinations of electrons. And those combinations behave like particles. This is in theory, at least, well. And, and, and the interactions of those particles behave like myron fermions under certain circumstances. So, um, but that's not the same as this other. This other question is very fundamental, that uh, a single electron could, could behave as well, or two things. In the first half of your fascinating talk, I, I, were you starting to tell us that the Schrodinger equation, although written in an analog form, would work equally well in a quantized universe. You certainly said that it could cope with quantized time. Can you extend it to that broader statement? Well, Schrodinger's equation was the entry into the quantum universe, right? Um, yes. Schrodinger, um, was, Schrodinger devised his equation to describe quantum phenomena, right? Um, we're observing not, we're, we're observing that it could be described as a discrete, in terms of a discrete process. So, if you use the Schrodinger's equation as written in an analog form, will the solutions be equally valid should mass, length, and time be quantized equally? Well, I've been conservative here, yes. so that when I reformulated the Schrodinger equation in terms of the discrete process, if you take the limit correctly, you just get the usual Schrodinger equation. Yes. So I, I'm not getting anything new when I take the limit. Okay. But the question is, what's new in the discrete process? Yes. And maybe something new comes out of that. So I don't know the answer. So perhaps the answer to your question is I don't know. But maybe. <laughs> Thank you for trying. Yeah. yeah. I've been running out of time or slightly over time. I just got one comment to make. After you told us this little fable, there was tremendous thunder outside. Now I wonder if this was a thunder of approval or the thunder of disapproval. <laughs> let us ponder upon that and let's get to be kind to. It's too bad I unplugged this because I have this nice slide about the Russell paradox where I have two pictures of Russell, one frowning and one smiling. <laughs> <laughs> I'll answer your question. <laughs> let's do that.